Well, good morning. You know, it is, it is a little difficult to follow a guy like Glenn. He's a phenomenal storyteller, and he has an incredible sense of humor. It's no wonder people are dying to work with him. <laughs> um, but I will say, I, I am, I'm a blessed, blessed man to be a part of a congregation of so many talented individuals. Uh, between the guys that we've had up here preaching every week, between the people who are constantly working uh, in, in doing things that a lot of people do not see, and a lot of the work that is being done in so many other ministries, we are just a very blessed congregation. I am a cat and a dog owner. I am not a cat owner willingly. Uh, that did not happen um, on purpose. Um, uh, but nonetheless, I do own two dogs and a cat. Uh, and because I don't have kids, then I have to talk about them. So here you go. Uh, but dogs and cats are very different from one another. Anybody who's owned both a dog and a cat, they know that they are very different creatures. For example, a dog has a very different demeanor towards people than cats do, right? Many of you have experienced this. Uh, dogs look at their owners and they say, wow, they love me and they pet me and they feed me. They must be God in the flesh. And a cat looks at their owner and says, they love me and they feed me and they pet me. I must be God in the flesh, <laughs> right? And uh, my cat is no exception to that rule. But, you know, I found in several years in ministry now that this is also true and there are two different types of preachers, okay? There are dog preachers and there are cat preachers. There are some preachers who look at their congregation and go, they love me and they encourage me and they support me. They must be God in the flesh. And there are some preachers who look at their congregation and say, they love me and they encourage me and they support me. I must be God in the flesh. And I, I hate that I kind of say that tongue in cheek because unfortunately it is very, very true in today's society. And unfortunately, I've even worked with a few such, such preachers. Uh, and it's, it's not a fun experience, and it's certainly not what we are called to. Today, I want to uh, read with you through 2 Peter chapter 2. And I'm sure as we were going through the scripture reading today, there was this, I saw some solemn faces kind of like, what is Jordan going to talk about today? Is he going to call somebody out? I'm not, I'm not trying to call anybody, don't worry, we're not, I'm not going to. This isn't going to be a big gossip session or anything like that, no. Uh, I will preface this by saying the men who have been up here who have been preaching have done such an incredible job of continuing to teach those things which are true and which are biblical, which adhere to Scripture. And so don't hear me saying anything here about, you know, there's no undertones here of people here that are trying to proliferate anything that is ungodly or unscriptural or anything of that nature. But I wanted to talk a little bit today about false teachings and false teachers. It's something that is warned about throughout Scripture. Uh, it doesn't matter if you are in the Old Testament. It doesn't matter if you are in the Gospels. When Jesus is teaching, it doesn't matter if you read through Paul's letters, Peter's letters, John's letters. It doesn't matter where in the Bible you are, almost anywhere you're at, false teaching is something that is addressed. And I don't know that it's something we necessarily talk in length about on a regular basis. It's something that we don't necessarily address head on. And there's a lot of reasons for that, I think. There's a lot of reasons we don't like to talk about the dangers of false teachers or the warning signs of false teachers or even just simply the fact that it's such a prevalent aspect of Scripture. It's something that's warned about so frequently. And I think it's because it's very difficult sometimes for us to come up with that confrontation. It's, it's sometimes difficult for us to, to point a finger, especially in our culture, and, and say, you're wrong. You are objectively wrong and you cannot say that. There are several other reasons that this has become less prevalent, I'd say, even just in Western Christendom, which is namely the fact that churches have been built, uh, not necessarily ours, um, but there are many churches, congregations that have been built on the premise that there is a teacher and they guide everyone and whatever they say goes and there is little room for accountability when it comes to false teaching. Whether that is by design 
or whether that is just simply cause and effect, it often happens that when there are false teachers that arise, there is very little that people are inclined to do about it. Now this is not necessarily the case everywhere. Some of you may, may have been parts of congregations where false teaching was brought up and false teaching became prevalent and it was quickly and swiftly dealt with in a biblical manner and that's good. It's good for us to see those examples of what it is to handle false teaching and, and how it is that we handle those who are willing to proliferate something that is objectively false and unscriptural. And I think it's something that we need to often handle but I want to talk a little bit today about what are the repercussions of false teaching. What are the repercussions of those who are willing to lead people astray? And the reason I bring it up today is because having worked in youth ministry for a few years now, I have seen some effects in my generation, in this generation, from false teaching that has been proliferated throughout Christianity and throughout those who claim to be Christians. Those who claim to be administering the Word of God are, are doing it in a way that is false and leads people astray and it has left a serious effect on people. And so for example, if you were to take a look at my generation, I would say that more people in my generation have left the church than anyone in the last century, any generation in the last century. I think that's pretty, pretty well known fact. But if you ask them why they've left, almost always if you get down to it, the issue is that their perception of what they were told church was, their perception of what they were told the Bible was, didn't match up with what they were reading in here. And when they got out on their own and they started to develop their faith on their own, they realized, you know, what I was told is not matching up with this. More, all, more, more than just that, that, that's one issue. The other issue is also this, that they are told one thing and then they go out into the world and they're persuaded by another belief. They're persuaded by something else. So false teaching hits them one way or the other. They either left because what they believed to be true ended up not being true and then they connect all, all church and all Christianity with being the false teaching that they were given and so they reject it and they reject church, which is a logical fallacy on its own, but we won't get into that right now. But they reject church and they reject everything because what they were taught was untrue. And that's one aspect. The other aspect is leaving and finding something else that more, is more convenient to believe. A false teaching that is more convenient to their lifestyle and they hold on to that because they say, well, what I was taught was not true because this other thing right here, this seems to be more true based on the fact that it is easier for me to believe and it adheres to the culture in which I live. And either of those things are a problem. Whether things are being taught from the pulpit or whether they're being taught from the streets about the Word of God, if they are untrue, they need to be addressed, they need to be reprimanded, and they need to be done away with because of the damage that they can do. Now, Peter is talking to the Christians here uh, in, in 2 Peter. He makes a big deal out of, of false teachers. It's a big theme throughout his entire second letter and really a good portion of his first letter. He's trying to help Christians understand and to address and to recognize false teachers and the danger that comes along with them. He says here in chapter 2, verses 1 through 3, as we read a moment ago, uh, many will follow their sensuality and become of them, uh, be, and because of them, the way of truth will be blasphemed. And in their greed, they will exploit you with false words. Their condemnation from long ago is not idle, and their destruction is not asleep. He's hearkening back to the days of the prophets, and, and even in those times, in the old times, there were people who spoke falsely. If you want a good example of that, you can go back to the story in Jeremiah where Jeremiah is trying to prophesy to them about their coming destruction, that they're living in wickedness and that they are going to face captivity, that they are going to face the wrath of God because of their, uh, because of their misdeeds, because of their unrighteousness. And a false teacher comes behind and says, oh no, no, 
we will be set free. He takes the yoke that Jeremiah is, has on his back and he breaks and he says, We're, the yoke will be broken because God is going to have grace on us because we are his chosen people. And Jeremiah says, you have just made this so much worse for yourself. Right? False teaching is and has always been an issue. And there's a lot of reasons for that. There's a lot of reasons that people want to say something that is biblically untrue. And whether that be that they want to gain a following or whether that be that they want, to believe, they want other people to believe as they do so that they can continue to live in sin. Whatever the issue may be, there are a lot of reasons that people may do that. But Peter is making a point that this is not new. It's also not old either. It's not as though we've moved past it. It's not as though we have grown to an age of uh, being so intellectual and so smart and, and so wise that we don't need to worry about false teachers because we're all on the same page. And our society would love to think that we are so smart and so wise and we can get all past this, but the truth of the matter is, clearly, we are not all on the same page. Now, when, when we hold to Scripture, when we continue to hold to this, we can stay consistent. But there are a lot of people in the world right now who would have us believe something that is outside of Scripture and say, well, you don't need to believe that because you know, that was written thousands of years ago and you know, really, we really don't know how, how true or how valid any of that really is and that doesn't really fit with what we know today about society and so you can just reject that. We don't even need to listen to that. And that is built on a lot of excuses. A lot of excuses that people make for themselves, maybe for others, maybe to gain a following for themselves. But regardless, they seldom, if ever, think about what the repercussions of this might be. Because we can look at Scripture and know objectively what is true and what is false. Truth is something that we should all strive for. Truth is something that we should all uh, seek to gain and seek to understand, but it's also something that we should all seek to live. But false teachers are not about that. False teachers do not want to send truth out. They don't want to seek truth, but rather they seek some kind of alternative means, some kind of alternative goal. And the truth always runs into that. The truth always is opposed to that. And so they want to find some way to make, make it seem as though their way is the truth and their way is right. But Peter makes it clear the, this is not something that is new, but this is something that is very damaging, something that can be very destructive. In verse 17, this is what he says about false teachers. Chapter 2, verse 17, These are waterless springs, mists driven by a storm, for the gloom of utter darkness for them, the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. I love Peter because he is so dramatic, right? I just skipped over an entire portion uh, of that, and you can go back and you can read it because it is, it is incredibly insightful. But the reason I skip over it is that Peter likes to uh, put things in lots of words to make everyone pretty clear on where he's at with things. So when he's talking about false teachers, he minces no words about them. He says, they are waterless springs, they are useless, they are mist driven by the storm, they are easily turned aside by all sorts of things, and for them the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved. That does not sound fun. I don't think I want to have to handle or have to deal with the gloom of utter darkness. That does not sound fun to me, but that's exactly what he says about false teachers. He says, they are the worst. They are the worst kind of people. They are not only useless, but they are destructive and they are damaging and their only use and their only purpose is to face the unbridled wrath of God. And that is not a category I want to put myself in. And so it is important for us to understand when we see a false teacher how dangerous that can be. When we see those who are teaching things that are against the word of God, how damaging it could be. And we live in a, in a time where everyone wants to get along. And I think that's a good thing, ultimately. I think it's good for us to want to get along. But I think the world would have us compromise on the truth of Scripture in order to do that. And honestly, that's just something we cannot do. 
It's something that we cannot afford to do, but something that many people who claim to be Christians are willing to do. They're willing to compromise on the truth of Scripture in order to go along and get along with everybody else. It's dangerous. He says, they, why is it that the gloom of utter darkness has been reserved for false teachers in verse 18? For speaking loud boasts of folly, they entice by sensual passions of the flesh those who are barely escaping from those who live in error. They promise them freedom, but they themselves are slaves of corruption. For whatever overcomes a person, to that he is enslaved. I, I like the way that Peter phrases this. Now, it's very similar to what Paul says in Romans when he says, you can tell some, who, who somebody's master is by whom they obey. You're a slave to the one whom you obey. Peter just comes outright and says that that which overcomes you, that is your master. You are enslaved to that. And so he says, these false teachers are allowing sensuality and, and desire and sinfulness to rule over them and teaching others that this is an acceptable practice. Teaching others that it is, it is okay to be ensnared. It is okay to be enslaved by sin. And he says, this is not an acceptable practice. This is not who we are because if we are going to be servants, slaves to God, we cannot serve sinfulness. We cannot serve unrighteousness. He says, uh, man, I just, I just lost my place. Don't you love that? Um, he says, if, for if after they have escaped the defilement of the world... Through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled in them and overcome. The last state has become worse for them than the first. That is a powerful statement right there. And it's one that we don't often bring up, but it's terrifying to think that someone who knows the truth and then instead of accepting the truth and allowing it to change their life, but instead takes the truth and to manipulate it to a way that benefits them or allows them to live in a way that they think is right, it is making a mockery of the truth. So Peter would say this is a very dangerous practice, not only for those who are practicing it, but those who follow them. He says it would have been better for them if they had never known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them. He says, what the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit. The sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in, its mire, in the mire. Peter is going back and saying, this is nothing new. This is not some, some radical new concept that people are teaching. What he's saying here could easily be written and addressed today, couldn't it? There are plenty of people out there that are... are saying all sorts of things. That, well, it's okay to live a sexually immoral lifestyle. It's okay to live a homosexual lifestyle. It's okay to live in a way that is deviant from Scripture. It's okay to live this way. And anyone who tells you differently is a bigot, that they're wrong, that they are, are simply too caught up in tradition to really see the truth. Our society would love to believe that the way that they live is okay, and so they'll find ways to take this and justify their actions. Now, what's worse, and I think where the problem really arises from, is that we have come from a, a long line in our, in our society, a long line, a long generation of preachers who preached what people wanted to hear. You understand what I'm saying? And that this didn't just come about in the last 10 or 15 years. I'm sure some of you can go back decades to people who have taught things that were simply taught for the reason of getting people in the door, for getting people to listen to them. And quite frankly, I think that that is one of the most damaging things to the church as a whole, especially to my generation. You want to talk about why my generation left? It's because what was being taught in churches was just simply untrue. It was simply a facade meant to get people in the door. And when people begin to see that and they begin to recognize what that is, they don't want that. People do not want, usually, 
if they're, if they're speaking into their soul, if they come seeking the truth, they do not want falsehood. If they come seeking the truth, if they come seeking the reality of God, the identity of God, they don't want to be fed a facade. But it gets people in the door and it makes people feel good and it's easy to listen to and it's easy to digest and so that's something that a lot of people will buy into for a little while, but it's not something, when you get down to it, it's not something that can ultimately change your life. For my generation, that's what it became. It became something that was just something you did, you went in, you listened, and it didn't really ever change your life, and so when they went off, when, when my generation went off on their own, there wasn't any real reason to adhere to it. Because it didn't define them, it didn't change their heart, it was just simply something that was spoken and it wasn't any, anything that was meaningful. It didn't come from the real truth of who God is, and it didn't come from the real truth of Scripture. So this is one aspect in which it's damaging. The other aspect in which it's damaging is that people got used to the church saying what everybody wanted to hear. Going along to get along, and just being okay with what the culture was doing. And so now, when there are those who speak up and say, well, this is not okay. People who would say, well, you know, the Bible is fine with you living that way. God is fine with you living that way. It's one thing for the world to live the way they think is right, but when people say, well, God says it's okay to live that way, now you're putting words in God's mouth and you're putting blasphemies out there. You are blaspheming the word of God to say that God is accepting things that are inherently sinful and objectively unscriptural. When this happens... People, and, and people get used to this idea that the church is going to say what, they're suppo- what everybody wants to hear. When opposition comes, it can become, people can become very hostile. It can become a, a major fracture in the church itself between people who believe, well, you know, these people over here say the Bible says it's okay to do this, so if you're saying otherwise, well, then you must just be wrong. You must just hate people. You must just be a bigot. You just must be super judgmental and so caught up in your old ways. You just don't get it. Because these people over here, they get it. They understand. And it causes that division. And I hate that that division has been caused. I hate to see it in the world, but it is quite prolific, the damage that can be done by false teachers. And not only that, but to think about the lifestyles that they lead other people to live is in and of itself damaging. We have been saved, we have been set free through the grace of God so that we could escape sin for people to come back and lead people back into the sin that their salvation was meant to bring them away from. It is counterproductive and is the antithesis of what the gospel message was supposed to be. And it's scary, and it's terrifying, and it's dangerous. And I think that that is not something that I I necessarily need to instill in, in most of you, because many of you were raised with the premise that false teaching is something we ought to avoid. False teaching is something that we need to turn away from. False teaching is something that we need to call out. I think we all understand that, but I think it's also important that we understand what our role in all of this is. Yes, we can talk about the damage that false teaching can do, and and Peter makes it very clear that this teaching is damaging, that this teaching is, uh, can be something that is very destructive if it is not dealt with. But I also think that it's important we understand our role, what it is that we are called to. In 2 Timothy, Paul is talking to Timothy, and he says something that we often quote. He says something that we, we, we say a lot, but he says it in, in a particular context. He says, I charge you in the presence of God and of Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead, and by his appearing and his kingdom, preach the word. We love that phrase, right? I, I can't tell you how many times I've been uh, and, uh, you know, and I talked about those, that, that Church of Christ. You've all been in that Church of Christ, the old one, you know, where you got your two lines of pews and there's the, the aisle in the middle and the, the overhanging archways and there's that little foyer with the little table. You know the one I'm talking about, right? 
we've all been in there and, and almost always there's right before somebody gets up in the newer days since they've gotten a projector which is that that's some newfangled technology if those who got projectors almost always right before the sermon they have three words written up there preach the word those are good words those are biblical words those are good good commanding words and I think that they are right to put those up there because it, it like it harkens back to this particular verse he says preach the word be ready in season and out of season and we like that verse a lot, and it's a good verse, and I, th I think it's, a, it's a, a good thing to keep in mind, but we don't always talk about what does in season and out of season really mean. What does he mean when he says, Timothy, be ready to preach in season and out of season? Well, actually, if we follow that up and continue reading, we'll see exactly what, he is, what he's referring to. Be ready to preach in, in season and out of season. Repro reprove, rebuke, and exhort with complete patience and teaching. For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away uh, from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. As for you, always be so reminded, endure suffering, do the work of an evangelist, fulfill your ministry. In talking to Timothy, he says, be ready in season and out of season. What does that mean? What is the, what, what is off season look like for, for a minister? He says, there will be seasons in which people will be willing to hear the truth. There will be seasons in which people are willing to listen to you. There will be seasons in which people are willing to accept your message. And there will be seasons in which they will not. There will be times when everyone is opposed, seemingly everyone is opposed to the truth of God and to Scripture. And Paul says is, your job does not change. He says, your mission, no matter the climate, does not change. Your mission is to continue to teach the truth, whether people accept it or not. Your job is to adhere to the truth of God's Word, whether people like it or not. Your job is to continue to call out these untruths, these false prophets, whether the people accept it or not. That is your role. That is your job. And as Christians, I think it's really easy for us to become complacent and we see the rest of the world and we're willing to call out some things, but we're not willing to call out other things. We see certain things that we know, well, you know, I don't really, you know, I don't really think that that's necessarily right. And we're unwilling to, to address it because we don't want to face that confrontation. Now, I will say that Paul makes a good point here. We are to address those things with patience. And we are to address it in a righteous, Christ-like manner. I don't think going over to people and taking our Bibles and beating them over the head until they get it straight is the way that it's supposed to work. Saying, well, how dare you, you just, you, you ignorant fool, how dare you not understand or see things the way that I see them. But I think we need to understand the power of the truth of Scripture. This is the divinely inspired Word of God. And it has power. Those who choose to reject the Word, those who choose to try to manipulate the Word for their own gain, those who would be willing to even reject the truth of Jesus, they are denied that power. But we, we have this. And it doesn't mean that things will always be easy for us, as, as Paul very clearly points out to Timothy. Things are not always going to be easy. It's not always going to be easy to tell the truth. It's not always going to be easy to say what needs to be said and hold to the truth of Scripture. And the time is coming and, and perhaps has now come where that is a very present reality. That saying what Scripture says is not necessarily a popular opinion. Saying what Scripture says and adhering to what it, it teaches is not something that is going to make you popular. It's not something that may necessarily get you ahead in this world. And maybe you will face persecution because of it. But regardless of that, what Scripture has to offer, we know, is greater than what the world has to offer. People will try to manipulate the Bible to say all sorts of things, but if it's not adhering to the truth, then its power is lost. 
And so long as we are willing to adhere to the power of Scripture, adhere to the truth of Scripture, we hold on to who it is that we are, our identity in Jesus Christ. We have a responsibility to adhere to that. Not only for ourselves, but those who may be led astray by false teaching. If we continue to walk in the light, we continue to be the light to the world. We continue to make the difference. We continue to be a path for people to see the truth. And Paul makes it very clear, we are not to deviate from that mission. No matter how difficult things may get, no matter how much of a challenge it may be, we have a responsibility to hold to the truth of Scripture. And that is not always easy. The world makes it very, very difficult. Satan wants to make it very, very difficult for us to want to hold on to this. For us to continue to walk in this because the rest of the world may go a completely different direction. And we want to go along with them or maybe there are people who are, are bound by their desires, they're enticed by their desires and they say, well, I want to believe something that is going to justify what it is that I want to do that is wrong. And that is not okay. It is not okay to just justify what you want to do that is wrong. It may be easier to believe certain things, but when we look at the Scripture, we need to be absolutely certain that the Word of God and the Holy Spirit are the ones who are guiding us in the right direction. If it's not that, and as Peter would say, if, it's come, if it comes from man, it's not really prophecy. Peter would point out later in chapter 4 in 2 Peter, he says... Uh, Sorry, not in chapter 4. In chapter 2 in 2 Peter, he says that prophecy was not derived from man. Prophecy is never derived from man. And if it follows some man-made inclination, if it follows some man-made teaching, it's not prophecy. It's not something you need to adhere your life to. It's not the path that you're, you need to take. What we need to take, the path that we need to take, and the mission that we've been given is to continue to preach the truth of God no matter what. And for me, talking to the people in my generation, that's kind of difficult because they have fallen into some deep and dark false teachings that you can live however you want. I mean, when Peter is addressing false teachings, when he's writing his letter, it was in the cruxes of becoming, in, 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 the, in the infancy of becoming something, uh, a movement known as the Nicolaitans, who just believed, you know what? The flesh is one thing, the spirit's another thing. Your spirit's been justified by grace. Your flesh, you can do what you want with that. And so they justified by that doing whatever it is that you wanted to do. And even in the time of Scripture, Jesus, Jesus only has a few words when he comes back to talk to John and he gives a vision. He spends a good portion of that addressing the fact that the Nicolaitans are so wrong. He's willing to address that. And it's not so different than the way people will think today, well, you know, we've been given grace, so do what you want. We've been given grace, and that was written so long ago, and that doesn't really matter, do what you want. We can't afford to live that way. We can't afford to buy into that. My generation, a good chunk of them have. And that is hard for me to look at, and it's hard for me to see. But I also know the solution is that I have to continue my mission. I can't be bogged down in that and I can't think, well, maybe, maybe I ought to just give up. Maybe I ought to just go along with what the rest of the world is doing. Everybody else is doing it. My generation is doing it. I'm kind of the minority. I'm kind of the outcast. It's not the popular way to go. It's not the popular opinion. Is that what I continue to do? And the answer is yes. Because my identity is not given to me by the rest of the world. My morality is not given to me by the rest of the world. It's not given to me by what is convenient. It's not given to me by my worldly desires, but it's given to me by the grace of God through Jesus Christ who sacrificed himself on the cross so that I could be with God for eternity. And I will not allow the world to deviate me from that mission. It may be, it may be easy to do it that way. It may be easy to deviate, but it's not worth it. And that's something what I want to leave you all with today. I don't know what may be going on in your life. There may be things that you know in your life that you say, you know what, I know I'm not supposed to be living this way. 
I know this isn't right. I know this isn't the truth. Let me tell you something. The power of God comes through the, through the gift, not the obligation, the gift of righteousness that comes from God. Truth will set you free. Christ said it himself. If you want to know the power of God, and it may be difficult, and I'm not saying it's going to be easy and your whole life is going to be peaches and roses the whole time. Don't hear me say that, but I will say the power of Scripture can change your life. The power of truth can change your life. And if you need that today, we're willing to to help you with that. We're willing to help you navigate that. If you've never become a Christian and you don't know what it is to be washed in the blood of Jesus Christ, to know the power of the resurrection, we can do that today. There's a baptistry right here. There's plenty of people to witness it. We want you here. We want you to be a part of that. I don't know what is going on in your life and I don't know what Satan may have done in your life to take your joy away, what Satan may have done in your life to, to lead you down a path that you don't like, I don't know what's going on in your life today. And the world may claim to know. The world may claim that they have the solution. The world may claim that they have it right. Let me tell you something right now. It doesn't matter where you look. You will never find completeness. You will never find wholeness. You will never find what it is you're really looking for until you come to the foot of the cross. So whatever it is this morning, if you have any need, why don't you come together as we stand and sing.